9.37 a.m. on Tuesday, September the 11th, terrorists flew American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. All 53 passengers and six crew members on the plane died, along with 125 people in the Pentagon, 70 civilians and 55 military service personnel. Many others were injured physically and psychologically from the attack. A moving memorial is now open to the public on the grounds of the Pentagon, honoring all people affected by the event. Today, we will explore only part of the story at the Pentagon, 10 years later. This is the story of the senior command staff. I am Ron Carley. I was county manager of Arlington in 2001. I have brought together today the four people who had the most critical operational responsibilities at the Pentagon on 9-11. I'm Jim Schwartz. On 9-11, I was the assistant chief for operations for the Arlington County Fire Department. Hi, I'm Ed Plugger. On 9-11, I was the fire chief for Arlington County. And I'm Jim Jackson. On 9-11, I was the commanding general for the military district of Washington. I'm Christopher Combs. On 9-11, I was the FBI weapons and mass destruction coordinator. Three agencies, three different command responsibilities, one incident. Who was in charge? Jim? Well, you know, I think that has to be the most often asked question uh, in the wake of 9-11 and other events. And there's not a simple answer to it, but I think the answer has to start with the idea that nobody's in charge of everything. You have to follow that question with another question, in charge of what? And there are many people that are in charge of many elements of the response. The key is to figure out how to unify that response so that it's coordinated and people are uh, well aware of how to complement the decisions uh, the, the respective decisions that are getting made in various uh, locations and in various levels of the response. So the way to do that is through the incident command system and by unifying senior leaders in a way that they can share information and again come to the best decisions collectively. At the same time, that only happens if we've done a good job of establishing both organizational and on some level personal relationships in advance of the incident. So that we are not trying to figure out who each other are on an incident and trying to figure out what each agency or what each individual brings to the table. The bottom line, you were the incident commander? I was the incident commander, but supported by others in a very similar senior role that were there to assist in all of that high level decision making. So Ed, you're the fire chief. Uh, what's your operations guy doing as the commander? Why not you? Well, You're the, the senior guy. The, uh, the philosophy that uh, is part of the incident command system and is one of the fundamental pieces is that you have to have trust in the people, you have to have competent people in the appropriate places, uh, and the operations chief is the best incident commander that I had at the time, as well as place him and, and the other individuals being placed in the appropriate roles. So in other words, even though the incident commander has a, a, a critical aspect of this incident in all incidents, they still have to rely, rely upon other people. So if you send the message that you don't have trust and confidence in your employees, then the incident will not go properly. And so it starts at the top. There was no doubt in my mind that we had the best people in the best place doing the best thing that they could possibly do at that day at that incident. But they needed assistance, they needed help. They needed an overview. How big was this incident? How complex was this incident? So there is what is called in the incident command system, what is called the senior advisor role. The mm -hmm. senior advisor is the right. only person who has the ability to remove the incident commander. That was the role I played that day. Okay. General Jackson, this is your building though. This is, this is the Pentagon. How, how do you let someone else command an incident of this national, international importance uh, on your ground? I mean, this is, not, this is not civilian territory. This is a U.S. military installation. Well, it was actually pretty easy. We went with the people who had the best capability to deal with the problem at hand, and that was the fire department. Uh, while the military's got assets, and we had, we had actually some fire responders down there at, uh, at the Pentagon, it, it was not really within our, it wasn't within our capability or our desire to command the thing at that time. So we went with the pros, and uh, it was a fairly easy decision to make. So what was your role down there? First of all, uh, my role was to be there to be the conduit that the incident commander could use to get into the Pentagon. And so I became the point of contact and allowed me and my staff to work with the, the right people inside the building because obviously you got some senior uh, 
governmental officials there who are interested, they're going to want to know information and they're going to want to keep track of what's going on. And of course, the other, our desire is to feed them that information without it becoming a burden. Chris, this is a pretty big crime scene. In fact, you had three huge crime scenes in the FBI simultaneously. Uh, so, so how do you approach uh, a working event like this, the fire collapse, and it's your crime scene? Well, when we look at terrorism scenes, we really break it into three phases. A lot of people ask me, you know, how is it the fire chief is in charge of a major mm -hmm. terrorist attack? The first phase of any terrorist event is usually a life safety. And as everyone's talked about, the only organization that can really do life safety and rescue is the fire service. So in phase one of that incident, we look to the fire department to be the incident commander. And then once we transition from phase one to phase two, which is the crime scene phase, that's when the FBI is the incident commander. And then once we're done with that crime scene, we turn it over to a consequence management phase, which we would turn it over to FEMA, or in this case, because it was a DOD facility, we turned it back over to DOD as the incident commander. The beginning of any kind of crisis of this magnitude, there is chaos. You know, our, jo our job, our, you know, one of our first orders of business is to try and bring some, uh, some order to that chaos. So the, the chaos is part of uh, the, you know, the early stage of the incident. And it's through our you know, tried and true practices of incident command, which the FBI had practiced with us many times before. Uh, you know, one of those stories that, that uh, you may have alluded to in your introductory comments that gets lost is that we had a major exercise in the Northern Virginia region the Saturday before 9-11 that all of the fire departments in the region and the FBI all participated in. It was a major chemical exercise that we did out in Fairfax County, Virginia. And so by working together, you see, you know, who's got strengths and who has capabilities that you can rely on to, again, bring, start to bring order to some of that chaos. So can other people who are trying to prepare for something that may happen in their community. And we know that Oklahoma City tells us it can happen anywhere from terrorism, but also the weather events that we're seeing that are so horrific. If they're trying to prepare themselves to ensure that there is not unnecessary chaos in a response, what should they be doing? I think the best way to prepare are through going to uh, field exercises or tabletop exercises together. So as Jim talked about, it's not the first time your organization or your command staff has interacted with the other agency. It's only because we went to literally hundreds of tabletop exercises or field exercises that when we get to 9-11 at the Pentagon, we all knew each other. We knew the capabilities of each agency. We knew the roles and responsibilities. So when you have these discussions as to who's in charge, what phase are we in, that's already been worked through. There's, there's not a discussion. We just know how it's going to go as opposed to you just lost a building, it's the first time you've met your counterpart, that's not a recipe for a good scene. The problem with building these relationships is it takes a lot of time. I mean, you've got to, you've got to put some effort into it. And so I, I know, uh, Chief Plogger, you were really committed to building an organization that could respond to a terrorist, but you'd never had a terrorist event. In fact, Arlington had never even had a really major event in its entire history. It didn't even see a battle in the Civil War. And so how do you set a priority to spend time and energy on something that has never happened and may never happen again? Uh, one of the stalwart moments or one of the key moments in the history of Arlington from my perspective, uh, being a brand new fire chief in Arlington County, was the Tokyo incident that occurred in 94 uh, with the sarin gas attack, which truly, from my perspective, told us that we needed to revisit how we were set up and what we were doing, uh, at, particularly for the region and our preparedness. Once we started that, once we assumed the leadership role in Arlington to prepare the region for a chemical or a biological attack, once we started working diligently to make sure that we had the entire region on the same page, fire chiefs, police chiefs, working hard with the FBI on the command and control systems, making sure that we had all, everything working properly, uh, it, it started to gain momentum. We started to receive federal funding. We started to receive federal recognition. The real job of a fire chief is to assess risk and make sure their organization is aligned to meet those risks. To me, it was very obvious, being in the nation's capital, being on the door of the nation's capital, that we had a terrorist problem. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time since then preparing for terrorism. You're fire chief now. You've got to make the decisions he was trying to make then about priorities. 
are we spending too much time on terrorism? Especially when you see the number of weather events that we've we've had since 9-11, Mother Nature's been much more effective than terrorists in attacking our country. Well, I, yeah, I think each community has to assess what are the most likely risks, what are the most likely events that, that they are going to uh, encounter and build their system to uh, be able to react to those most likely events. Certainly, you know, in the Midwest, tornado activity uh, is most prominent. Uh, in the southeast, hurricanes, you know, as we start the new hurricane season now, uh, are, are most prominent. And in many of the urban areas, terrorism remains uh, somewhat of a threat. Now, how to measure that threat, I think, is less material than trying to build systems that are adaptable and that can deal with uh, different kinds of threats. You know, when you when you talk about your preparedness activities, what you're really doing is building baselines of, of capabilities that can be used for a weather event or for a large fire or, in our case on 9-11, for an act of terrorism. So I think, in, you know, the term all hazards is used a lot. That term has to be uh, used in a way that acknowledges that we can't prepare for everything equally, but we have to prepare for everything on some level because every community could uh, be touched by, you know, some sort of large weather event or an act of terrorism. Now, one of the points that you've made to me, General, is that uh, your professional training uh, led you to be the one to cause these events, to attack other people, our enemies and in this case our enemy attacked us. What, what was your reaction when you arrived at the Pentagon and saw your headquarters successfully attacked by an enemy? Um, I mean, it's almost, you're almost operating off of autopilot when you move in there. It's off of prearranged thoughts and patterns that you've built and, and you know, the way you decide, the way you engage, and you're just doing. Um, I brought some staff with me, and of course they moved around with me, and they were, you know, offering insights and uh, assistance and communications back and forth. Um, but it was, uh, I mean, it was a pretty hectic time. It wasn't several hours before we looked at our watches and realized what time of day it was. But uh, I mean, there were things going on. It kept us busy. Yeah. Did you stay too long your first shift? Probably. <laughs> I remember going home late that night, real late that night. Three simultaneous terrorist attacks, two unbelievably successful. FBI take that personally? I don't know if it was personal, but we understood immediately that, that we were under full attack. And, and even for us, it was bigger than the three sites. We also had the hijacked airports, which for us was a site. So while we're at the Pentagon with hundreds of agents, we actually set up another command at Dulles Airport where the hijacked plane took off from. We had 100 agents out there. Um, so with us, we very quickly had to break it down into different components. We had our response component to the sites, our investigative components to those hijacked airports. And you didn't know if it was over. And we didn't know if it was over. In fact, uh, we were receiving immediate intelligence that a number of uh, jumbo jets coming across from Europe um, accidentally had tripped their hijack um, messages to tell us they were under hijack coming in. So there was that fog of battle of we have additional planes out there that are coming in. Where are there more attacks planned? What is the next step? So we were looking in many different directions as to what the problem was. Yeah, so what were you feeling on that day? I, mean, I can distinctively remember standing there with, with Jim and saying, you know, this is it. This, this is what we've been training for. The, the, the fight is here. Uh, in somewhat disbelief, obviously, with the size and scope. Being on the scene, though, we didn't have a full view of what had happened. We knew New York had been hit with two planes. Um, I personally was not aware of the collapse of those towers for hours into that day. Um, the events that ended up happening in Shanksville, we didn't really have a full, clear picture of that uh, for much, much later in the day. We knew there was a plane that had gone down. Uh, my initial reports to me that it, the plane had hit Camp David, which led mm -hmm. to, to more confusion. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of intel out there um, from a number of streams that, that talked about other attacks, and we were working to either confirm or uh, push aside that intel it is not accurate. But we had reports that the State Department had been hit, the White House had been hit. Luckily, we could see D.C. from where we were, so we didn't see the smoke, and we pretty much felt that that, that wasn't true. 
Uh, we were told that Cleveland had been hit. We weren't quite sure why or how that played into it. Um, so you definitely had that fog of battle that we had to chase down to provide the intelligence to the partners. Did you overstay your first shift? Absolutely. I think everybody did, and you know it's hard. Everybody knows uh, you need to go home. You need to turn command over. I, I think the the perfect shift is a is a dedicated 12-hour shift, and then people need to leave to rest to come back for your next 12-hour shift. Um, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to have people leave. They leave. They want to come back. They want to be in the fight. Um, and that's one thing that we've tried to work on is, you know, after 12 hours, if you look at the research, accidents go up, your your cognitive ability goes down, so you really want to try to push people out after 12 hours. But it, it's a hard task to manage. Yeah. Either of you uh, go home after 12 hours? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I didn't go home the first time until the night of the 12th. Uh, so, you know, uh, close to 36 hours before... Uh, I got my real first break, and I and I echo uh, what what Chris and the general have said that um, you've got to make those in more manageable pieces. And I'd go one step further that I think in the initial stage of the incident, somebody who's going to be in that prime decision-making role probably you know needs to get a break after four or five, six hours, and I mean a significant break because the amount of decision-making going on in the early part of that of an incident of this scale is just. Uh, enormous, and it you know it'll settle down after a while. But just the way things are coming at you, uh, you know, you just and the way that you're walled off from everything uh, other than the incident, I think, just calls for consideration to spell somebody in one of those positions even earlier than 12 hours. You can you can then you know get into a rhythm and and get people in 12-hour in uh, shifts after a little while, but I think in the, in the first phase, it's, it's got to be far sooner. Can you remember what you felt when you arrived on the scene? You know, I, I don't, clearly there was a sense of awe, but I think it was, it was somewhat tempered by the fact that we uh, were, were watching the images in New York uh, evolve before it happened at the Pentagon. Uh, we had, you know, watched, you know, as much of America did, that second airplane go into the South Tower, which for us confirmed what we had be what we had already assumed because of the uh, first airplane, and that was that these were intentional acts. This was an act of terrorism. So I think you know there was maybe a, a momentary sense of of disbelief, but then, as the general said, you're going to work. You know, you've you you've got to marshal all of your energy, um, you know, towards executing the tasks that need to be done. You know, to focus on life safety and gain control of this fire, and and you know, gather the situational awareness. If you are going to be overcome by emotion, you're going to be far less effective. And 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 I don't know that anybody, certainly in the leadership team, was feeling that way. What were you feeling, Ed? Uh, actually, um, actually, I, I I think it was a couple of years later before any emotions really started to come back in. Uh, it it was. Um, Pretty remarkable because I'm a pretty emotional guy, and the department knows that. And and but at the same time, I I basically didn't know I had the ability to just turn them off, and, and just went to work. You know, commandeered a helicopter from the Park Police, made sure that we understood the complexity of the incident, made sure we understand how much of the Pentagon, 6.6 .6 million square feet, was involved. Um, and so I, I, I'm not really sure I had room for emotions. Mm -hmm. I, I'm real, I really don't. Uh, and now that I think about it, I, I probably didn't have room for emotions. Uh, is that and true? Is that a similar story for each of you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're into that almost yeah. muscle memory at this point. You're just going with what yeah. you've been trained to do. Yeah. yeah. There was some thought, though. I mean, every once in a while where you had a brief moment, for instance, some of us knew people who were in that building. Right. And so you'd, you'd have these flashes periodically, but then you'd come back to reality, and you couldn't allow yourself to go down that road. There was, there'll be time later to grieve. Right now, the mission at hand is to get this area fixed and get it under control. And, yeah. you know, when you're working with guys who know what they're doing, it's not hard. You kind of saddle up together and off you go. The 9-11 the Commission described the response of the Pentagon. I actually didn't discuss it a whole lot. There's very little uh, text devoted to the Pentagon response and des described it as mainly successful for most of the reasons we've been talking about, uh, but they said that no event is flawless. So, you know, what, what if anything, would you have done differently? Yeah? Um, yeah, that's always a very tough uh, yeah, question, and I get asked that question a lot. Uh, it's a very tough question for me because 
I, I think the, the, the crews and the individuals and all of the partners that we had there, and they truly were partners, performed extraordinarily. And so anything that would be said would be construed to be uh, somewhat of a criticism. Uh, and, I, and I don't want anything I say to become uh, a criticism because there is no criticism from my standpoint for any of those partners. Uh, the uh, working out of the ability to communicate across the wide spectrum of an incident like this, I think could have been and should have been uh, and hopefully today will be improved. It is a very, very difficult um, and complex array of individuals who have to be there. I, I mean, just think, just think of the transportation people. Just think of VDOT, who's trying to get traffic to and from up and down 395 and, and on the interstates through 66 that have to know what's going on because they're part of the process for solutions. And you've got to, you've got to work that. I mean, the Joint Operations Center where we had 60, over 60 players there being fed information on a daily basis, that has to be proved, improved and seamless. I think it's a great place for new technologies. I also think it's a great place to affirm the, the systems that we have and make sure that we don't leave a key player out. Uh, dovetailing on what Ed said, the command went ahead and restructured itself, knowing that we were going to be in the national capital region come, you know, whatever, we're going to be here. We're an asset available. Why not roll us under NORTHCOM, which has the responsibility for the military for the northern, or for the continental United States? Uh, we went in and presented that as a plan, and that was accepted. And so the now the so basically what you created somewhat ad hoc on 9/11 has been institutionalized. Exactly, exactly. It's been institutionalized and been helped to fund with some some joint money to be able to do some of the work they need to do. We went out and we put money aside to buy new communications capabilities. We now have a van, a big vehicle that will roll in and has all the connectivity to plug into anybody just by sitting there, put up masks and whatever and can start bringing in comms right to that location. So the, we didn't you know, a lot that. of those have been bought around the country. Has that been a worthwhile investment, these communications command vehicles? If you use it once, it will be. Yeah, I have to agree that uh, if you get on the incident scene and you're incapable of uh, communicating with each other and, uh, you know, again, with people oftentimes outside the incident scene, I mean, there were times on this incident scene where we had to be party to uh, secure communications that you know couldn't be shared outside right. traditional means. So, you know, I, I think some of these capabilities uh, are, are absolutely essential, and and, and I would echo that uh, when you need them, there isn't a replacement for them. There isn't an, there isn't an alternative. Now, you know, have we, you know, have we overinvested? Have we missed opportunities to share some of these resources? Perhaps. I mean, certainly on 9/11. The, our fire department did not have that kind of command pod or command capability. We had to initially use our police departments, and when that was less than adequate, we actually were afforded the opportunity to use that from the Fairfax County Police Department. But uh, harking back to something I said a short time ago, that came as a result of these regional mm -hmm. collaborative relationships that had really matured to a state that um, you know, they weren't questioning why they were giving up a fundamental resource that they had. They simply knew that, you know, it was critical to supporting, you know, the overall effort. But if there had been an attack at CIA or Fort Belvoir? Well, the regional system would have provided for another command unit that would have taken their place out there. Uh, and again, that's one of the, the beauties of having a system that acknowledges that your capabilities don't stop at a political boundary, at a jurisdictional boundary, that you can move resources up to fill in gaps as they continue to occur. Did your uh, experiences on 9-11 change you in any way? Uh, in short, I'm not sure that uh, there was any single thing on 9-11 that caused me to change. Um, obviously, for many of us, it was our first physical contact with terrorism on a personal level. Um, so I'm sure that had some impact. Um, but but I don't think, I think the, the military experience kind of pre prepares you for this kind of deal. And uh, we've been through similar events and deployments, unknown, you know, no notice kinds of things, deaths and so forth. And so we have some kind of a capability to deal with that internal you know, connection to this and to be able to, to make it work. Did 9-11 affect you in any way personally? Um, it, it's um, uh, impossible to say that uh, you could have gone through 9-11 
particularly uh, performing the role that I performed without being affected by it. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a life-altering, community-altering, life-altering, uh, nation-altering uh, series of events that occurred. So we all were affected by it, and uh, we can't paint it any other way. Uh, personally, I was affected, um, uh, you know, I, I was a firm believer that um, you have to rely upon good people to do the right things at the right time. And I think that was affirmed that day. So a lot of my beliefs were affirmed. Build the right infrastructure, have faith and confidence in the people, give them their lead and let them perform. And they will amaze you. They will amaze you continuously with the level of performance. I think, as the Chief said, 9-11 has to affect you. Um, I think it, it's affected me personally in, in a redoubling of my effort for counterterrorism. Uh, especially on the FBI side where we see all the secret cables and, and all the, the intelligence that's out there that I think thankfully the American public doesn't see every day. It, it really drives it home as to what we're doing and why we have to work so hard. You've gone from assistant chief to chief. 9-11 changed you any? Well, I think it's brought a lot of the things that, you know, that we prepared for. Uh, in advance of 9/11, you know, it, it, it made them real. So um, there's a there's a certain satisfaction that we were on the right track uh, and that we um, built some effective systems and capabilities that could react effectively to an event like that. Um, I guess it also taught me that as I assumed the position of chief, that uh, I'm not I don't have the the real luxury of um, trying to run the fire department. You know, I have to, I have to lead an organization where uh, I've got good leaders beneath me who can do the daily work of running the organization so that I can work at this institutionalization process, so that I can work across these boundaries, not just regional boundaries, jurisdictional boundaries, but also work with uh, our partners in law enforcement, our partners in public health, our partners in emergency management, our partners in the nonprofit world who all contribute to this, this enterprise. So. You know, beyond um, going through the experience, you know, the shared experience that, that others here um, uh, went through, it, it's more about, you know, how do I focus on the right things and how do I build an organization that will sustain these efforts after I leave, you know, whenever that is. So it's, I guess it's made, you know, the, the ideas that we were contemplating before 9-11 more real. Um, in a way that I don't think any of us could have predicted or invited, certainly, you know, but I'm glad we did that work and now that work continues. It just continues on a new level because I think that the, the, the threat is, uh, you know, ever more realistic than perhaps it was when we were doing that planning before 9-11. Um, I, I think, you know, if anything else, it's, it, it, it is about understanding that my role is to serve a community and that that community has something to offer you know in this enterprise also and we ignore that you know really um, at our own peril because sooner or later we are going to face another incident you know whether it's as large scale as 9-11 or or smaller we're going to depending be depending on those people and and you know part of my role is to engage with them to find out what their needs are and also sort of in the leadership role prompt them to to engage uh, with each other thank you Thank you all very much for coming together. Uh, Jim Jackson, U.S. Army, representing Department of Defense, Command, the Pentagon. Chris Combs, representing the FBI. Ed Plogger and Jim Schwartz, Arlington County Fire and Rescue Department. Thank you for your outstanding response on 9-11. Thank you for what you've done every day. And thank you for a career in public service.